So we've introduced the idea of angular friction um, as a, a sort of material-specific parameter. So we know clays have a certain angle of friction and cohesion, and um, sands have a certain angle of friction and cohesion. But actually, it's not a material-specific parameter. So we've introduced the idea of angle of friction um, and cohesion, the shear strength parameters, as sort of material-specific parameters. But they're not really. Um, Angle of friction, uh, like this graph shows, changes with it, changes of density with the material. So, with increasing relative density, we can also see that the angle of friction it increases. Um, and this graph also helps to define angle of repose, which is the angle of friction at the lowest uh, density. So, angle of friction changes with changes in density. We know moist, uh, moisture con content. Um, water content of the soil affects the cohesion. So these aren't really material specific parameters and what would be really useful in soil mechanics is to have a set of parameters that were specific for the type of material that we were looking at. So what, uh, what critical state theory does is it models the soil at the point of failure as a frictional fluid which means that it starts to flow as a, as a almost like a liquid, as a, a bit like molten metal. Um, the problem in some ways is that a lot of soils don't behave like that. So the use of critical state theory does come with, with uh, substantial health warnings. So if we return back to uh, this diagram where we have, uh, where we, when we introduced the shear box test, uh, where we have the shear strain against the uh, x-axis and a uh, specific volume against the y-axis, and what that showed was that when we sheared our sample, the sample reached a point that, uh, called the critical uh, specific volume. So uh, depending on whether we, uh, we were talking about an initially dense or initially loose material, uh, it didn't really matter because it would reach the same uh, critical specific volume. Now that critical specific volume is, in, is on the critical state line. So if we did the shear box test on different uh, normal um, uh, effective stresses, put a new, new stress onto the lid of the, the box and, and replicated the test, we would, we, we would get different, uh, uh, different lines on this, this diagram for different normal uh, stresses. So the, um, there would be a relationship which we could then plot between the normal effective stress and the, uh, the critical um, specific volume, and that would be a, that would, and that would generate a, a straight line, or theoretically generate a straight line. But we also know that there's a relationship between effective stress and shear stress within the material, the more Coulomb failure envelope. So what we can do is plot these uh, three things together on one um, set of axes, um, and that would be in three, di three dimensions. Um, so let's just make some space for that. So if we plotted those, those two lines together on um, the set of three axes, where we have normal effective stress, shear stress, and specific volume, we could see that it would form a line that looked like this. Um, and the blue uh, line underneath is the projection onto the uh, normal effective stress and specific volume axis. And the, uh, the yellow line here is the projection onto the the um, shear stress uh, specific volume axis. And the orange line is the critical state line. So what usually happens is this, um, instead of expressing the information like this, um, the information is expressed in terms of stress invariance. So if you remember that you have two, um, two dimensional stress invariants, you have T, um, which is the, the radius of that Mohr's circle. So you have um, sigma max minus sigma min divided by 2. And you also have s, which is the, um, the center point of the circle, which is then sigma max, or the average stress. Those are the two uh, dimensional stress invariants. Um, and those are appropriate when we're talking about conditions of plane strain. But when we're talking about conditions that aren't of plane strain, like in a triaxial test, we need to then bring in sigma 3, uh, the intermediate um, principal stress.
And there are two uh, three-dimensional stress invariants. There are, uh, there's one called the deviatoric uh, key, which is essentially saying similar things to, um, to, to T here. Um, what the deviatoric stress is, is the, um, the, the stress or the contribution of the stress that um, deforms the material. And we also have P, which is the average uh, stress. So the, the reason why we do, do uh, use these uh, stress invariants is that it lets us talk about um, uh, generic stress conditions within a soil um, without uh, referencing any specific absolutes. So um, that's uh, why it's quite useful. So if we uh, again do the same thing with, uh, but now plotting Q against P and specific volume against uh, P, um, we can draw um, another two lines. So the first line is uh, a straight line, and that has the equation Q equals MP. And um, on this uh, graph, we can draw another straight line, and that has the equation of V equals Um, big gamma minus uh, lambda ln p. So these are the critical state lines represented um, in this um, stress invariant uh, space. Um, but what it has been able to define is material specific parameters. So m is notionally a material specific parameter, as is gamma and lambda. So we've gone from a situation now where from talking of, uh, from using uh, angular friction and cohesion, which are um, which change depending on um, uh, uh, conditions within the soil. to now talking about uh, material specific parameters. And that's really the benefit of critical state theory. So this uh, also helps demonstrate uh, the concept of stress paths. Now, stress paths are the, the paths that the stress conditions within your soil go through um, uh, during loading. Um, and these change depending on whether you're looking at a drained or an undrained material. So for drained material, you might start off with a, a, a condition here where you have a, um, a given value of P. Um, and in a drain test, you would increase the um, increase the, the stress conditions until you reach the critical state line where the material uh, would then flow or notionally flow along that critical state line. So that's for a drain test. Um, and from that, you could then um, make some sort of statement about the strength of the material. But in terms of uh, um, uh, drain, undrained conditions, the stress path might look completely different where it might start at the same value but because, you're, um, not, uh, because water pressure isn't dissipating, you might have conditions that look something like this, where again it flows up the, uh, the critical state line, but it reaches the uh, critical state line uh, much sooner than what would uh, happen in a drain test. So you get, in this case, a much different value for, for st uh, the strength of the material. So that's another reason why this critical state theory is important. And it also helps explain why the stress paths to reach that critical state are also important to understand.